Another evangelism report for you. On August 26th, I went down to the Provo City Center Temple, and I got to speak to Ben and Maddie. This was a couple that met while in Alaska on their LDS missions. They said that the LDS priest authority was what most differentiated the religion from others. So we walked through sections of Matthew uh, 8 and 9, a little bit of the end of chapter 7 as well with examples of Jesus teaching and healing and forgiving and exorcising, not exorcising, but exorcising demons with complete authority using his words alone. If you look on YouTube, I've done some material on this. Uh, It's uh, on the authority of Jesus. In Matthew chapters 8 and 9 especially, uh, you'll see examples where Jesus can just say the word. Um, For example, with the... with the, uh, with the Roman officer who had a servant who was sick to, to the point of death, he says that he knows uh, what authority is like. He, he, he's a man of authority. He, know, he knows how it works, and he knows that Jesus can just say the word and his servant will be healed. He doesn't even need to visit uh, his residence or uh, come see in person this servant who is sick to the point of death. Excuse me. So uh, I, I just love to walk people through the stories of Matthew 8 and 9, and really establish a pattern that Jesus really can just say the word. He has utter authority. And intuitively what this does for somebody who's aware of, at at some basic level of what God is like, uh, just in their conscience, even if if they don't believe these things, it's that uh, God alone has the authority to create by the word of his power. And this same power is the same power that Jesus used in Matthew chapters 8 and 9. It alerts us to the fact that Jesus is God in the flesh. Well, uh, then we we went on to talk about what Jesus said about his own words. Uh, Jesus says in Matthew 7, verse 24, everyone who hears uh, these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock. In John 6, 63, he says, the words that I've spoken to you are full of the spirit and of life. Uh, in John 5, 24, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. I'm not necessarily quoting the references here. I just know these <clears throat> statements of Jesus, and I love to, to string them together. In John 15, 3, Jesus says, you are, you are clean. You are already clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. John 17, 17, sanctify them in the, in the truth. Your word is truth. Matthew 24, 35, uh, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. So what's the point in sharing things like that? The foundation of verbalized authority that Jesus lays does not fade. It's not like milk that spoils or bread that goes stale. His words endure, and the words that Jesus gave to his foundational apostles are God breathed. So these words are living and active and infinitely authoritative. No one who hears Jesus say, be healed or walk or your sins are forgiven or go needs additional divine authorization. This is why it's so silly to think that you need uh, what I call priesthood papers to, uh, to ultimately authorize what Jesus has already commanded by his word. So they said that they had a unique priesthood for uh, administering ordinances like baptism and laying on of hands, and that none others outside the LDS church had such unique priesthood authority. So I asked, what does the New Testament teach about priesthood? They drew a blank, and so I walked them kindly through uh, the the basic argument of Hebrews chapter 7 and the unique priesthood. G, uh, position that Jesus is in. Jesus uh, has no need to be replaced with another high priest because he has risen never to die again. He has no need to offer another sacrifice because he offered himself as the final and sufficient atonement. We have no need for another priestly intercessor because Jesus forever intercedes in heaven to the Father on our behalf. We have no more need for other proxy ordinances, because Jesus at the cross was our ultimate proxy. 
Have you ever wondered, uh, thought about that? Uh, when when Christians engage in an ordinance, it's not a proxy ordinance. Jesus uh, accomplished the singular and sufficient proxy ordinance on our behalf. When Jesus was on the cross, the veil of the temple was torn in half. He opened up a, quote, new and living way for us through the curtain that is through his flesh. That's Hebrews 10, verse 20. Uh, Hebrews 7, 25, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him. Jesus is the ultimate mic drop. Jesus delivers the definitive word. He himself is the conclusive revelation. Hebrews 1, 1 reads, long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Jesus is the final and sufficient capital P prophet. <laughs> He's the uh, final uh, high capital P priest. He is the Lord, Lordly King, capital K, King of Kings. He is the Lordly King of Kings, and he is the concluding new covenant head. Believers in this Jesus have the free gift of the Spirit that he sends he, and the forgiveness that he grants, the authority that he verbalizes, the relationship that he provides, the community that he creates, and the future that he secures. This couple kindly took literature and we uh, kindly end, ended the conversation. I, I love giving people Jesus. I love laying on uh, the words of Jesus very thick, um, talking about uh, Mormonism or you know just any, anything that counters the Word of God is, is it's interesting and useful and faithful to engage those issues. But I love uh, getting to the words and works of Jesus Christ. Later, I spoke to uh, J- I think he said his name was Jacoby. <clears throat> I'm not sure if uh, I remember that correctly. Uh, he was a 19 year old homeless soft-hearted young man, gave him a very simple gospel presentation. Um, I repeated it and re- repeated it again. I invited him to come back with us next the next week, and he seemed interested to read the New Testament that we gave him. He plans to return to California and live with his mother, who is newly on probation. If you could pray for him, that would be great. We also spoke with Tiffany, a local homeless lady. She was likely on drugs, uh, high on drugs. It was very difficult to communicate with her. And uh, gospel presentations become especially concise when you're speaking to someone like that. Jesus died and rose again. Call upon his name and you will be saved. She said, you mean call upon him like in prayer? And I said, yes, pray to him. Jesus, save me. Also spoke with Eric, who was an ex-Mormon atheist. He was riding on a bike and he was fully covered in tattoos. And I asked him, have you ever heard a summary of the gospel? Uh, He said he had not heard it. So very simply, then we walked through God, who God is, creation, Jesus, the person of Jesus, uh, his work on the cross, his resurrection from the dead, and the call to repent and believe. And then we just summarized it again. We, we just, in a more brief form, reviewed it all over again. Uh, he took a New Testament. He wasn't hostile at all. Uh, he was a friendly listener. If these were simple seeds. I, what I like to say evangelism is a lot less like seminary and a whole lot more like Sunday school. Uh, most of the gospel presentations we give are very simple and very repetitive. And we love hearing the beauty of the simplicity of the gospel come out of our own mouths back into our own ears. It is very encouraging. Um, let's see here. Then I spoke later with Chip, who was a committed Mormon. He was a great listener. Uh, he asked great questions, and we walked through what it, what it, uh, what makes the Christian God one hundred percent different from the LDS God. I've tried to make this point. It's not as though the LDS deity or deities and the Christian God are slightly different or in a Venn diagram and they're, you know, they have a lot of overlap. I, I, I think it's important to see that um, fundamentally they're a hundred percent different. Here's how uh, God, according to the Bible knows everything and learned nothing in Mormonism, everything that God knows he learned in the Bible. God never received a, according to the Bible, he never received 
a gift. And in Mormonism, everything that God has, he received. In the Bible, God is incomparable to any other. And in Mormonism, God is comparable to all the other exalted gods. In the Bible, God is the first and last and only and the most high God. In an, and in Mormonism, God has ancestor deities and enables future generations of gods who will receive worship from their own subjects. In the Bible, God is alone uniquely worthy of worship. He, he is very unique. <laughs> he is utterly unique. He, he alone is worthy of worship. In Mormonism, God is in a common class of beings, exalted beings, who are worthy of worship from those under them. At one point, we talked about how uh, the LDS Jesus possibly belongs to multiple overlapping godheads. I'm not sure if you've ever thought about that before. He called them divine units. Uh, so think about this. If the LDS uh, Jesus is exalted as a father someday, if he becomes a spirit father of another generation of spirit beings and has his own planets to govern, which is at least uh, a scenario that many Latter-day Saints hold out as plausible. Uh, in this scenario, he, uh, he, he could be, uh, a, he could have dual membership in two godheads, one in which he is the son and, in, and another in which he is the father uh, and he has his only begotten son, that Jesus someday in this scenario would have his only begotten son. So he would belong to two godheads. Uh, so uh, what was his name? It was uh, Chip. Chip said that he thought that the bond of each godhead unit, he called them units, was their shared purpose. So I asked him if Jesus belongs to two godheads and they share the same purpose, if these godheads each respectively have the same purpose, then why aren't these two godheads the same godhead? Does it make sense? There are at least two LDS views I have encountered on this. Either there are multiple overlap, some overlapping godheads. Either, so either there's multiple godheads, some of which are overlapping, or there's one expanding godhead out of which a subset acts for any given, given world. I also asked, do the heavenly wives of each of the male deities join into these godheads? Uh, does our godhead consist of at least six exalted deities. In other words, do the heavenly wives of the exalted deities, do they, do they ha also have Godhead status? Um, are, are there potentially more than um, three deities in this Godhead? All of this reinforced the extreme polytheism at play and the stra stark contrast with Christian monotheism. This sets us up for talking about connected differences. So this is very important. Our uh, our world our respective world view, views here are not simply different at the bullet point level. They're different because they're holistically and systematically different. Uh, uh, so let's 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 think about some things. In Christianity, sin offends an infinitely holy and unique most high God. So s even sin in the Christian worldview ultimately has a reference to God. Why is sin so bad? Because it offends and it contradicts the moral nature of the most high God. So sin is not some abstract category uh, that is just relative to whatever God you're under in the multiverse. In Christianity, sin is ultimately wrong and ultimately defined by its departure from the moral character of God. In uh in, in Mormonism, sin is more of a more abstract category, um, and you have polytheistic deities, um, and so sin is it, it, can, it, it, it doesn't conform to this eternal law which all the gods are conforming to. So it takes on a very different uh, nature, sin it does, and, and it, uh, it, it's much less offensive. It's much less dramatic. Sin is much less of a big deal in Mormonism. In Christianity, God, the most high God, became a man, whereas in Mormonism, men become uh, so-called most high gods, who are each respectively, uh, who can receive worship from their future generations of spirit children. In Christianity, Jesus has two distinct concurring natures, a divine nature and a human nature. This is the miracle of forgiveness that, that the word who is God became flesh. And in Mormonism, it's Christ's, uh, Christ, he, he progressed unto 
uh, different stages of God. Hood. I've heard this called minimal godhood and premortality, and maybe like a full or exalted godhood uh, after his resurrection. In Christianity, our final joy is knowing the one true God. Uh, Jesus said, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So the highest pleasure and joy and satisfaction is to know God. Some, some people will... Uh, associate this or, or call this the beatific vision. To, to know God uh, is the highest pleasure. In Mormonism, the highest joy is helping others become most high gods. In Christianity, salvation is ultimately designed for God's glory, uh, where it, I mean, it gives him the credit, him the boasting, bragging rights, and the joy of a Christian is giving God all the glory and recognizing that all things are from him and through him and to him. In Mormonism, salvation is designed to generate more most high gods who each are glorified as most high gods. In Christianity, in the Bible, worship delights in the incomprehensible God who graciously and personally reveals himself. In Mormonism, there is the worship of a finite deity who is fundamentally of the same kind of being as us. This conversation I had with Chip was satisfying because we were able to weave together the nature of God, the two natures of Christ, the miracle of forgiveness, the cross, and the need for repentance and faith. Uh, if you have trouble talking, for example, about grace and faith and works with your Latter-day Saint friends, I highly recommend situating the subtopic of grace, faith, and works uh, inside the larger uh, consideration of who God is and creation and the, the purpose for all of uh, existence. So we talked about repentance from the sin of idolatry. We talked about faith in the Most High God who offers absolute forgiveness. Anyway, this was a very satisfying uh, night down at the Provo City Center Temple. Um, you can pray for the Christians. There's a regular gathering, uh, weather dependent, of believers who love to share the gospel. It's a very simple gathering. We hand out tracts, we sing, we pray. Uh, if you ever want to join us, please message me. We'd love to have you. If you're LDS or if you're just a, a non-Christian and and you just would like to come and have a conversation with us, uh, be it that you're investigating Christianity or if you're even very, um, if you feel very indifferent to it or even very critical of Christianity, you have some objections or complaints about the way that uh, the way we see things, perhaps you're a progressive liberal and uh, you don't like our, our uh, common politics as born again Christians, the way we see social ethics and social uh, is issues like, like referring to sexuality or marriage or the way the body should be used. Uh, maybe you would just like to tell us why you think we're wrong. And we tell you what, <clears throat> we're not offended by that. Just come and have a, a pleasant conversation with us. Uh, you should know up front that we're very committed born-again Christians. We're very committed to maximizing our belief in all of the Bible, and we want to grow in having uh, courteous, uh, kind conversations with people that we deeply disagree with as we share the truth of God from the Bible. Thank you for listening. As you can tell, I am back in Utah. I have this nice mic set up, so I, I, I feel like I'm talking like a radio guy right here, but... Um, I'm really so, excuse me, I'm so glad to be back in, uh, I'm in South Jordan, Utah, um, back in our old house, uh, doing seminary classes online, back at the Mission Church, uh, back in the the workplace office, but back just doing uh, uh, Utah things and enjoying uh, the mountains and the, I, I call the mountains my uh, our street preachers. They preach at me every morning telling me about how good and awesome that God is. Utah is a beautiful place. Sometimes I joke that Colorado is a beautiful preview of just how beautiful Utah is. So please come out and visit us.